Depression is a huge health problem. Depression has now become one of the world's fastest growing mental disorders. 10% of U.S. adults will likely have a depressive episode in 12 months. Compare that with 20% of U.S. adults in their lifetime. Depression creates a tremendous and untold burden on many people's lives, and it affects millions of people worldwide. Those who experience depression know that they're in a vicious cycle. Even though you want to get out of your depressed state, you feel you are robbed of the energy and motivation to get out. Then you feel guilty and helpless, pushing you to a deeper, depressed state. When someone is depressed, almost everything seems overwhelming to them and even slightly challenging tasks look impossible to achieve. You feel the stakes are even higher when you are withdrawing from antidepressants. But whatever may be the challenges you are facing or someone you know is going through, depression is not the end of the road. Surviving depression is not impossible. This documentary is a self-help approach to dealing with depression. The film is intended to provide you with life skills, nuggets of insights, and simple tools to help you manage your state of mind and your body. Depression is much more than a mood disorder. It's a multi-dimensional disorder and it impacts different aspects of your life. Well, in describing depression as technically a mood disorder, but much more than that, I think we could also say that depression is a disorder of superlatives. Depression is perhaps the most lethal disorder given the number of people who lose their lives to suicide. Depression can be considered the most costly disorder economically. The literally tens of billions of dollars that are lost each year in the economy by people making bad business decisions based on depression people who are unable to work, calling in sick, people who perform their jobs badly, jobs that need to be redone, people who cause accidents because of carelessness and the self-absorption typical of depression. Depression is also the most costly in terms of quality of life. The unfulfilled potentials of every human being that get lost to the sorrow and despair of depression. And so to appreciate that depression is a multidimensional disorder, that it has many different facets to it. And in fact, no depression is unilaterally the same across all individuals. Each person will naturally experience depression in their own way. We can't have just a one-dimensional viewpoint. This isn't something that we're going to be able to develop the magical once-a-day pill that makes the depression go away. We really have to give depression the respect that it deserves as a complex, individualistic, multidimensional phenomenon that requires a better-than-average understanding of the nature of depression if someone hopes to overcome it. Depression can also be better understood as a social problem than a medical problem. The question about depression as a social phenomenon is an important question to address. One of the things that we have known for many, many years is that moods are contagious. I think almost everyone knows that from life experience how there are people who walk into a room and they instantly spread rainbows and sunshine and make people smile. And then there are other people that walk into a room and literally suck the life right out of it and turn it into a black hole. The fact that mood spreads is a phenomenon known in the world of social psychology as the emotion contagion. Well, the contagion of emotion applies to a wide range of emotions, from fear and panic to depression to euphoria. But in the world of depression in particular, 
observing the quality of interactions between depressed people and the people around them, how one depressed person at work can contaminate the work environment, how one depressed partner in a relationship can contaminate the relationship. So much of what depression is about is perspective. The kinds of things that not only happen in our lives, the events themselves, but the things that we tell ourselves about the significance of those events. Well, the meaning that we attach to events is a socialized phenomenon. Clinicians call it an attributional style. But in simpler language, it's an explanatory style, the way that we explain the meaning or significance of events around us. Well, explanatory style isn't something that you're born with. It's something that you acquire through socialization. And it's really no surprise then that when we look at the explanatory styles of young children, how close in form and structure they are to the attributional styles of their parents. And really, how could it be any other way? Every time your two-year-old asks the question, why mommy, why daddy, your answer inevitably contains within it an attribution, an explanation, a value that's being taught, a perspective that's being taught. And it's so that quality becomes a way of thinking, a way of interpreting events throughout the course of life. Well, the culture that we live in shapes our perspectives. The family that we grow up in shapes our perspectives. The significant people who teach us what to value, what we should consider important in our lives. This is all a product of social interactions. And so when I wrote the book, Depression is Contagious, I really reviewed independent conclusions drawn across many different fields, from genetics to epigenetics to affective neuroscience to social psychology to clinical psychology to epidemiology. All of these different fields that independently came to the same conclusion that your social environment has a far greater impact on you than anything else in terms of how you develop your understanding of the world around you. And it's your understanding of the world around you and your place in it that shapes your responses to the events in your life whether you suffer adversities and think of them as ruining your entire life, or whether you suffer setbacks and pick yourself up and dust yourself off and move on with the next thing that you need to do, the essence of being resilient in the face of adversity. I genuinely believe there will never be a medical solution to what is largely a social problem any more than there will ever be a pill that cures racism or poverty. There will never be a pill, my prediction, that will cure depression. Instead, we want people to acquire the kinds of skills that allow them to face the challenges of life with skill, with finesse, with an empowered sense of being able to respond effectively to the things that you face in your lifetime that give you the sense that your life is worth living, that you have the skills that you need to live well. A college certified life coach, but also being clinically diagnosed with depression and anxiety, I've been able to see the difference between like people that have clinical depression and people that don't. People that don't tend to have clinically diagnosed depression and anxiety, they normally are triggered by a certain situation and they can bounce out of that sadness or you know anxious moment faster than someone that has been clinically diagnosed. Me personally, 
it took me a longer amount of time to be able to say to myself, I am okay, to be able to take a step back and think rationally about the situation rather than emotionally. But someone that is not clinically diagnosed, at least from my personal experience of coaching a lot of personal clients, is that when they are sad, it's usually because of one specific thing. And then once they realize that, they can bounce out. But someone that is not, they see this one thing and then add on every single other thing that they're unhappy with in their life or that isn't bringing them happiness. That to me is the difference between someone that is clinically diagnosed and not clinically diagnosed. Clinical depression is characterized by its intensity, duration, impact on functioning, and a host of specific symptoms such as mood changes, such as extreme sadness, intense irritability, and feeling of easily frustrated, a loss of interest in most of life's activities, a profound lack of vitality, sleep disturbances, fatigue, and low energy, loss of sex drive, and changes in appetite and weight. When depression is misunderstood and labeled as a negative thing, only then it becomes a problem for us. And we have that negative, devastating experience that comes with horrible side effects. Our body gets drained energetically and it shuts down our immune system, our digestive system, and all of our growth mechanisms. In essence, flight or fight mode is triggered and we effectively go into a proverbial shelter mode. That's when our cells are not in the growth mode, but in the survival mode. And the effects of that are devastating on our psyche as it only perpetuates negative states, affecting our health and well-being greatly. It's going to stop your food from digesting and assimilating properly. It's going to prevent your body from being able to detoxify properly. And that will cause an increase of inflammation and oxidative stress throughout the body. One of the first consequences of this would be a lowered brain function and it often results in a lower IQ. Then from there on, that can manifest in various ways in the body. It can affect your muscles and joints, causing pain and inflammation. That can also change your gut bacteria. Your serotonin levels are lowered. Your feeling of well-being is reduced, which makes the cascade of symptoms even worse. Once you start feeling more stressed out and anxious, that can affect your cortisol and adrenal functioning, which results in even more oxidative stress and inflammation. These can then easily lead to other horrible diseases like cancer and heart disease. The impact is, in that way, a lot greater than what it seems on the surface. Just think about it. If we don't find a way to stop all that pressure and turn that negative spiral around, our cells will use the resources that they have and literally die out, slowly but surely. Luckily for us, that process is rather slow, and there's plenty of ways to turn it all around and fully recover from all the side effects, especially when we overcome the root cause of this problem. A depressed person becomes extremely negative in thinking. Thoughts of hopelessness, fretting, worrying, brooding, and more inclined towards giving up on life. Depressed people can also inflict non-suicidal self-injury, called NSSI, on themselves. NSSI can be interpreted as a cry for help. But there is more to it. If you cut, scratch, slam, burn, rip, or engage in any other variety of self-harm, it is usually used as a coping skill. Sometimes it occurs when things are too overwhelming and you want to feel like at least you have control over your own body. Other times, it happens when you are so numb and antidonic that it seems like the only way you can feel something. Here is the bitter part about non-suicidal self-injury. A solid portion of suicides is accidental. It's not suicidal, it's self-injury gone fatal. The best course would be to get professional help. It's okay to admit it, and it is something that anyone can transition out of as they can find more healthy ways of coping with their depression. Depression is much more complex than the popular understanding of chemical imbalances of neurochemicals like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Depression takes many different forms and has many different causes. Each person who experienced depression may have little relationship to what another person is going through. And no two people are going to experience depression the same way. The question of what causes depression is paradoxically a simple and complex one to answer. Simply put, depression is caused by many things. And paradoxically, that's what makes it so complicated. 
When we look at the many factors contributing to depression, some of them are in the biological realm, some of them are in the psychological realm, and some of them are in the social realm. Biology has been in the ascendancy in recent years. People paying more attention to the biology of depression, striving to find the medical basis, the biological basis, and consequently with great hope, a biological cure for depression. Well, one of the things that has come out of the Human Genome Project is the recognition that there isn't a depression gene. There are genes that make you vulnerable to depression, but there isn't a singular depression gene. So to say that depression is caused by your genes is really a misconception. What has come out of the genetic research, however, is a deeper understanding of epigenetics. Epigenetics as a field is the study of how environmental influences shape genetic expression. And if you want to know where the hot research is right now, the most current research right now that's valuable, it's in the realm of epigenetics, addressing the question of what is it about social environments that gives rise to depression? What is it about the human brain that makes us vulnerable to social conditions and environmental conditions in such a way as to give rise to depression? Well, biology does matter. There are diseases where depression will be a predictable consequence. Likewise, there are medications that one can take where depression will be a predictable side effect. But it's also true that the biology of depression has been vastly overstated. That the gains that we have made in our understandings of depression have been primarily in the psychological and social arenas. And the best way to verify the truth of that statement is that we have gone beyond treatment now to be able to talk intelligently about prevention. There are many causes of depression and of course genetic and biological, neurobiological, and several other forms of causes for depression have been identified. But oftentimes we overlook that there are several psychological and social causes of depression. For instance, some people have a particular attributional style that poses risk for depression. This attributional style involves internal, stable, and global explanations for bad things that happen in life. Take, for example, someone who loses their job or gets a divorce. They might determine that they are to blame as an individual, that because they are to blame as that individual, they're likely to not change, and so this is a very stable explanation. And again, because it is they themselves that are at fault, it's likely to affect other areas of their life. So they might feel like their career or their prospects for future relationships might be equally in jeopardy. So to say that internal, global, and stable attributions is a way of thinking that tends to lead toward depression. That is the attributional style of what would be uh, called pessimistic attributional style or pessimistic explanatory style. Well, if we look at the psychological factors, that domain, that encompasses things like a person's personal history. We know, for example, that people who have suffered early childhood abuses, as well as significant losses, have a greater vulnerability to depression. In the psychological realm are also things like coping skills, how to cope with the stresses of life in positive ways, problem solving skills, the ability to recognize and handle problems in a timely and effective way, the ability to think clearly. We have been able to catalog, identify, and articulate many different styles of thinking that create a vulnerability in people. After all, 
The way that you think exerts a profound influence on the way that you react to things. Your interpretation of the meaning of events that take place in your life is mediated by your own thought processes. And so paying attention to how people think, not just what they think, but how they think, has been a very, very fruitful area of research. And more than that, it has been a very fruitful area of clinical intervention. Some of the most well-supported research shows that the ability to help people think more clearly makes a big difference in being able to reduce the severity of depression, reduce the frequency of episodes of depression, reduce the length of episodes of depression. Also in the psychological realm is the behavioral part of a person's experience. What do people actually do? Well, we know that the people who are active in addressing their depression do better than the people who are passive. So the people who actively seek out pleasurable activities, who make a point of going out and doing things that make them feel good, whatever those things might be, whether it's spending time out in nature or whether it's going out dancing or going to movies or socializing with other people. But the more active someone is in building experiences that can bring pleasure into their lives, the better they do, the better their quality of recovery from depression. And then the last domain is the social domain. The social domain speaks to the importance of healthy and positive relationships as a buffer against illness of all sorts, not just emotional disorders like depression, but certainly we have a lot of evidence to show that the better the quality of one's relationships, the better one is likely to feel about life in general. And so to have the kinds of skills that it takes to build positive relationships that are enduring relationships, stable relationships that we can count on, the importance of having close people in our lives that we can open up to and talk about what we're thinking and how we're feeling and what our ambitions are and what the problems are that we're facing. Unfortunately, these days, relationships have taken some pretty serious hits. Relationships aren't as stable as they used to be. They don't last as long, it seems. Higher divorce rates, shorter marriages, multiple marriages, people moving geographically, relationships naturally suffer as a consequence. People who spend more time online in chat rooms than they do actually spending time with other people. So it's really no surprise from the social side of the equation that the people who spend more time with technology are more likely to report feelings of isolation and depression. So what I've just described to you now is what is known as the biopsychosocial perspective the recognition that there are many different factors contributing to depression. And some of those factors I've now mentioned, I can add some additional ones. Diet matters. Exercise matters. Being able to use your time well, time management skills, having ambitions and goals of things to look forward to and things to strive for are all really important things. Keeping yourself physically healthy, keeping your relationships healthy, all important things to being able to feel good. So there are many different contributing factors. And it's also then why each person's depression is going to look a little bit different. For some people, it's much more about relationship issues that are the source of their depression. For other people, it's much more about the distortions in their thinking that's the basis for their depression. So having an insight into how these many different factors can be arranged in many different configurations across many different individuals is important to appreciate. No two people are going to experience depression in exactly the same way. 
because of how many different contributing factors there really are. There are biological, psychological, and social causes to depression. Trauma plays an important role in developing depression. Trauma is an emotional response rather than an event. That most of us think that trauma is one major event, like a car accident or being the victim of a crime. But there are so many invisible traumas that we experience from the moment we're born. And so in this case, I'm defining trauma as an, as an external event, something that happens in our lives that triggers and creates many overwhelming emotions that we're not able, especially when we're young, to process and make sense of. And so we, we learn how to block them to survive and to go on. But repeatedly blocking emotions over time causes too much stress on the mind and body from this conflict between core emotions that need to come up and the suppression of emotions with anxiety, guilt, and shame. And over time, that stress really hurts us and creates symptoms. If we classify depression as almost an umbrella um, that symptoms fit underneath, so it could be either severe or, or mild, um, what we've lived through, um, we don't often use the word trauma, but everyone will have lived through experiences and it could be um, small traumas or big traumas, uh, traumas that are known or not known. Um, and so the numbing of our human psyche um, through not being able to cope, being um, overwhelmed, um, has our body shutting down. And so we may experience low mood, um, lack of motivation and absence of joy. And I think they're often symptoms of traumatic um, events or life experiences. So I think there's definitely a link. I don't think I've ever met a person who has never had some form of trauma in their life. People who experience traumatic events sometimes develop post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Research suggests that almost half of people who have or have had PTSD experience depression. Additionally, people who have had PTSD at some point in their lives are three to five times more likely to develop depression than individuals who didn't experience PTSD. There are other ways of thinking that can cause depression or at least make it more likely. Um, it's also the case that there are many things in life that might predispose one to experiencing a depressive episode. Sometimes these things are the loss of a loved one or the death of a friend. Uh, it could be the case that someone loses their job or maybe they find that they have tremendous interpersonal conflict either at home or at work. All of these things are significant causes of depression and things that we should think about in terms of how to prevent depression. Some folks are more likely to experience these kinds of significant troubles, and these would be people that oftentimes are lower in socioeconomic status or have lower levels of education or opportunity, or groups that are traditionally, uh, uh, that we hold prejudices against certain groups such as blacks or other minority groups that have blocked opportunities and this may also threaten uh, depressive episodes. Depression is also a sign of how we mismanage our emotions, especially our core emotions. The way that I look at depression is that it is a symptom of blocked and buried core emotions. Core emotions are these biological programs that every single one of us have. They are anger and sadness, fear, disgust, joy, excitement, and sexual excitement. And we have these emotions for a reason. They're really a compass for living. But unfortunately, we live in a culture that doesn't help us with emotions. In fact, we're sort of inadvertently taught to block and bury them. And when emotions naturally come up, because of things that happened in the environment, traumas and the wounds of our childhood and whatnot, just the trials and tribulations of living, if we continually block and bury our core emotions, eventually we will feel very cut off from our authentic self and we can develop symptoms like depression. Often depression is experienced as a defense mechanism. When we lack the capacity to handle our core emotions, 
When you are depressed, you are out of touch with your core emotions. Core emotions are above all physical experiences. Now that's something I never learned growing up. I thought emotions were happening in my head, but in fact they're triggered in the middle of the brain and then they are meant to affect the body. And they're meant to affect the body because the purpose of core emotions is to make us move in some way that is adaptive to survival or to thriving in life. So maybe, um, maybe you can relate to the feeling of sadness and how you sense sadness in your body. I sense it as a heaviness in my chest. I sense anxiety as a kind of vibrating experience, a full body full body vibrating experience. I experience anger as a, as a kind of tightness in my jaw, a fire in my belly, and a tremendous amount of energy that that's, wants to come up and out. And usually it wants to come up and out and do something mean or say something mean because it's in response to being hurt. So when we know all these things, we, we find ourselves being kinder to ourselves. When I was young and I had emotions and I was angry, I used to really beat myself up. I didn't like being angry. And I learned lessons like it wasn't nice to be angry. And then I learned that anger is a core emotion. It's universal, like all the core emotions are universal. Men and women and every gender in between have these same core emotions of anger, sadness, fear, disgust, joy, excitement, and sexual excitement. And they're all these separate programs that are there to help us. They're a compass for living. But when we squash them down because they weren't welcome in our families and they weren't welcomed by our parents or our parents didn't know how to deal with our emotions and they shut us down or in a moment of exuberance our parents were busy and distracted or upset, so they shut us down. And then our brain learned it's not safe to have these experiences with our parents. Then we go on with life, but every time an emotion comes up that we learned it wasn't safe to have, that emotion gets bound to either shame or guilt, or we hold it down with muscular tension that we feel as anxiety. All of a sudden, we're cut off from our connection to our deepest self and the deepest truths of our authentic self. And that's ultimately what creates depression. There is a massive rise of depression in this 21st century, and we can't ignore the phenomena known as the polypharmacy as one of the major causes of depression. A Mayo Clinic study found that seven out of 10 Americans take at least one prescription drug and a 2017 Consumer Reports survey found that over 55% of Americans regularly take four prescriptions on average. This means that more than half of the U.S. population is under the influence of polypharmacy, that is, simultaneously using multiple medications day after day. Sadly, a common polypharmacy side effect is depression. In 2018, University of Chicago conducted a study which, for the first time, demonstrated that the simultaneous use of prescription medications is associated with a greater likelihood of experiencing depression. Researchers found that more than one-third of U.S. adults are taking at least one medication that can trigger depression. In a large case control study conducted from 1995 to 2013, antibiotic usage was found to precede diagnosis and treatment for depression, with recurrent courses of penicillin antibiotics resulting in a two- to five-fold increase in depression diagnosis. The reason antibiotics are bad is because they damage the ecosystem in your gut, the microbiome. That's the 100 trillion bugs that live inside you and that actually outnumber your cells by 10 to 1. And here's how antibiotics mess you up. They not only destroy the bad bacteria that you're trying to fight, but they also destroy the good bacteria. It's like herbicides. It can kill everything if you're not careful. There are trillions of bacteria in your gut, and they collectively contain at least 100 times as many genes as your own genes. You're literally only 10% human. The bacterial DNA in your gut outnumbers your own DNA by a huge margin. You've got like 20,000 genes, well you got like 2 million bacterial genes and they're doing all sorts of things. They're controlling your immune function, they're regulating digestion, 
They're affecting your gut function. They're protecting you against infection. They're even producing vitamins and minerals and nutrients, even regulating your brain chemistry. So not only do antibiotics destroy these good bugs, but they also encourage the overgrowth of bad bugs and yeast, which then leads to a whole mess of symptoms like mood disorders, food allergies, fatigue, skin problems, digestive issues, and lots more. Trauma, abusive relationships, loss of someone you love, extreme poverty, a never-ending series of tragedies, all these can act as triggers for a depression episode. There is a seasonal affective disorder, which is kind of a depression that is only expressed during certain seasons, like winter depression. Mothers can also have postpartum depression, which is when baby blues followed by the birth of a new little one continue to be strong and persistent after a few weeks. Postpartum depression, PPD, is a serious complication of pregnancy that happens to almost 15% of mothers. It is, in most cases, a temporary issue, but it can transition into major depression if left unchecked. According to a Mayo study, women are nearly twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with depression. Gender differences and the impact of depression both in men and women is a new field of inquiry. New studies and constant findings in social epidemiology of mental health and in the area of gender gap in depression point out that men and women experience depression differently. The epidemiological research has been remarkably consistent over the last half century that women experience depression at a higher rate than men across cultures. In the United States, the ratio is about 1.8 to 1. There are some cultures, most notably in the Middle East, where the ratio can be as high as 3 to 1. Now, it's true that there are some individuals who believe that this is not an accurate reflection of what's going on, that men and women really do experience depression at roughly the same rate, but perhaps express it in different ways. And that is a hypothesis that's worth investigating. And what we have to go on to this point, however, is half a century's worth of data to show us that there really is a gender difference. Now, attempting to explain the basis for the gender difference has given rise to several hypotheses. One hypothesis is a purely biological one, highlighting the fact that at least half of women will report fluctuations in mood just on a monthly basis alone associated with their menstrual cycle. Other hypotheses are more sociologically based. The recognition that there are many social inequities that women face that men do not. Women are more likely to be physically and sexually abused in childhood. There is a gender gap in the economics of how women are paid less to do the same job as men. Women are more likely to be hurt economically in unfair divorce settlements. Women are more likely to be living at the poverty level than men. Poverty is certainly a condition that gives rise to a greater sense of helplessness and hopelessness, which is foundational to the experience of depression. Some research has also shown that men and women, because of different socialization histories, have different ways of coping with adversities. That men, for example, are socialized to be more action-oriented, and women are socialized to be more passive. Women are more likely to engage in a coping style called rumination, of thinking and thinking and analyzing while men are more likely to go out and take action. Too often, unfortunately, the action that men take isn't particularly bright, but the fact that they're more action-oriented seems to ward off depression to a greater extent. So the research once again shows the value of an action orientation. Of course, we want the action to be intelligent and timely. But when we look at all of these differences between the kinds of stressors that men face 
in comparison to the kinds of stressors that women face, it highlights how societies need to continue to change, need to continue to grow, how sexism needs to continue to diminish, and women's issues taken more seriously. The rate of depression in women is too high and consequently women are also more likely to differentially be given prescriptions for antidepressants more frequently than men. Surprisingly, men and women are genetically very different from each other, more than we know it. There's a researcher named David Page who is an MD and since we've sequenced the genome now, um, it had been assumed, and all the literature said this, I mean, up until fairly recently, that humans were the same genetically 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, and the, the belief was, you know, people from different parts of the world, if you're from Africa, or, you know, some people saw it as mm -hmm. kind of racial differences, well, this race is better than the other. And they said, no, you know, 99.9% .9 were the same genetically. Mm -hmm. Well, recently, again, not so many years ago, they found that that was true. We were 99.9% .9 the same if you talked about two men okay. or two women. But if you compared the genetics between a man and a woman, it turns out they're only 98.5% the same, which means that the 0.1% difference compared to a 1.5% difference is 15 times. Okay. So you and me, you know, are, you know, 15 times different genetically, or me and my wife, than me and Andy. Uh -huh. You know, two guys. Uh -huh. that we uh, only differ by 0.1%. And if you think, well, that's not a very big difference, well, it turns out, and some people have heard this statistic, that the difference genetically between a human male and a chimpanzee male, which we'd agree if we had a yeah. chimpanzee sitting here, most people would say you're probably different. Yes. Uh, but that's the same difference. The difference wow. is 1.5% difference, 2% difference between me and a chimpanzee. So again, these are, these are differences that really make a difference. Even though many studies indicate that depression is approximately twice as prevalent among women as it is men, that statistic can be incorrect. Depressed men get mad. Depressed women get sad. Ron Kessler, PhD. Women tend to go in, and because of, I think, of social conditioning, men tend to go out. So they externalize that behavior. And I think men often go to external soothers. And ultimately get themselves into some unhealthy practices. So internal soothers could be things like classically addiction. So drink and drugs and gambling and sex, uh, it's all out there. And so it ends up being a kind of behavior. One of the core issues, I think, which really um, stop men getting help for depression is something we've learned very early on in our lives, and I think generally from our fathers, and that is self-reliance, that we have learned that we need to rely on ourselves. So we rely on the things that we have always relied on. And that could be, again, going back to those external soothers. There is important difference in suicide between men and women at all ages. The suicide rate for male is an average nearly four times higher throughout the lifespan than it is for females. According to Marianne J. Legato, the signs and symptoms of depression in men are very different than those in women. This is a researcher who wanted to understand the effects of drugs and medications on treatment for depression. So he got a, a group of people who had been diagnosed for depression had been treated with antidepressant medication and they all got better. Uh huh. And with their permission, he asked if he could give them a, a cocktail of a certain kind of amino acid that would block 
the effect of serotonin in the brain. Yeah. And serotonin is the feel-good chemical and the antidepressants often were ones that increased serotonin. Uh -huh. So basically what they were doing was creating an artificial depression among these people that had already been treated. And what they found was a very interesting thing that was different between the men and the women. Hmm. The men experienced a total denial. They said, no, I'm not depressed. You know, no, I feel fine. But they had an inordinate desire to go to a bar to get a drink. Interesting, the, yeah. The women, and Sue was an example I, I wrote in my book about her, as soon as she took the cocktail and in a sense lowered her serotonin level, she immediately became sad. She started to cry. She recalled huh. her father's death and you know, became very sad and emotional. And so when they evaluated that, they said, again, a, a validation for the way men yes. experience depression is different from the way women. A study that we did a few years ago shines some interesting light on important coping mechanisms, especially as we look at men and women. What we found was that for both men and women, the relationship between forgiveness and depression was different. And that is, for women, forgiving other people seemed to be really important and was something that cut their risk of developing a depressive episode significantly. On the other hand, for men, it seemed to be forgiving themselves that cut the risk of depression. So as we think about depression and we understand uh, sex and gender differences, um, it's, it's very interesting to also consider the ways in which um, the, the different approaches to coping with stressors in our lives might be related to those risks. And it's very important um, to take those things into consideration as we think about the most effective ways for men and women to deal with depression. I was put on antidepressants when I was 15 years old after my father suddenly passed away. You know, I was a child at the time. I didn't really know what was going on other than the fact that I knew that I was in pain because my father had died. I was numb, I was sad, but I was also only 15. And so I was able to kind of keep moving on because I was a child, I, I could kind of block it out. But a lot of the adults in my life did not feel like I was processing the trauma as well as I should be. And so therefore they put me on antidepressants. I stayed on two types of antidepressants for 15 years. Those prescriptions never changed over the 15 years that I was on those drugs. And I assumed that because a doctor had told me that I needed these drugs, that I would need them for the rest of my life. I thought I was broken. I thought my brain was broken. I thought that this was just who I was and this is how things were going to be. When I was about 30 years old, I realized that I had spent half my life on antidepressants and that maybe I needed to change my course. I was still incredibly depressed, I was suicidal, and I realized that if the antidepressants were working, then why was I still so depressed? I decided to try and get off the medications in order to find my baseline, because after 15 years, I had no idea who I was without these drugs. And so I started to go off the antidepressants, and quite frankly, the experience was horrific. I saw a psychiatrist, and she told me to stop taking one of my drugs to cold turkey, now, that's really not recommended, but the problem is, is that many of these drugs do not have reasonable ways to taper. So I was on a drug called Effexor and I was taking 37.5 milligrams of that drug. That is the lowest dose that you can get at a pharmacy. So what else was I supposed to do? My doctor didn't have any other idea how to have me take a smaller dose. And so the only option was for me to go to cold turkey. The experience of getting off this drug was absolutely horrific. Within a few hours, because my drug had a very short half-life, I was experiencing heart palpitations, nausea, irritability, all the things that you would maybe expect. But what I didn't expect is that about a few days later, I felt like a layer of cellophane had lifted off my body. 
colors suddenly became more intense. The sounds of the New York City became so intense that I couldn't really walk out onto the streets without feeling like I was being assaulted by this energy. My skin started tingling, my taste started changing. It was just like after 15 years, I was finally feeling for the first time. And in some ways, it was really intriguing. And in other ways, it was terrifying because I was entering into a world where I didn't know anything about who I was and how I felt. And so as a few days went on and I, my body started to try and get rid of these drugs, I started having incredible, awful psychological symptoms, really intrusive thoughts where I would have these violent flashes that would pop through my head and they lasted for weeks. I mean, this wasn't something that happened once and then I moved on. These, intri these intriguing thoughts were so bad that I thought I was insane. I thought I really needed to be medicated because I was afraid I was going to hurt myself or I was going to hurt somebody else. And so I contacted a family friend who was a psychologist and she told me that as long as I was aware of the thoughts that I was having, then I wasn't going to hurt everyone. I knew that what was happening within me was almost this like chemical thing that overtook my body. But my psychiatrist didn't know anything about these symptoms because I was too afraid to tell her because I knew that if she knew what was going on in my head, I would possibly be committed to a mental institution. She could put me on an involuntary hold because of possibly hurting myself. And so I was too afraid to tell her. And instead I decided to wait out these symptoms and they lasted for months, but I started to see little bits of hope, these little glimmers where suddenly I would notice something beautiful in the world that I never noticed before. Or maybe I would look at some colors and it would be brighter. Maybe there was a moment where I felt like myself in a way that I hadn't ever felt my, like myself as an adult. And it was these little glimmers that helped me realize that the experience I was having, yes, it was terrible, but I knew it was going to be temporary. And so I needed to push through. I just didn't realize how long it was going to take. One of the key challenges for people who suffer from depression and who are already taking antidepressants is to deal with the withdrawal symptoms. Antidepressants are, as we know, often they're habit forming. And so your body gets used to whatever it's given. Um, it also becomes more tolerant. So people's um, uh, dosage often goes up or it, people often report it stops working. And so obviously if your body is dependent on a, a particular drug, as you come off that drug, your body is going to kind of go into withdrawal symptoms. And so um, I think that's why it's difficult to come off them. You'll probably need support from your GP. It may be a tapering off. Um, we don't advise that you stop taking antidepressants suddenly because the withdrawal symptoms can um, really um, send you into a spin. I've seen um, months and months of psychotherapeutic work um, undone by somebody's being medication being swapped very quickly and her body that had been kind of almost kept level with the antidepressants suddenly her anxiety is through the roof and she's having panic attacks so these drugs medicate and smooth things out and they help um, change our brain chemistry and so of course coming off them can be um, problematic um, it, it, it is a process of coming off safely and your GP is your best one to support you with that. I think it's also important to think about when you come off them because if you've just had a bereavement, if things are really unstable for you, then that may not be the best time to look at uh, reducing your uh, medication. So um, I think timing is really important as, to, as also the, the when and the how needs to be carefully managed. The problem with antidepressant withdrawal is that the process can last a very long time. For me, it took well over a year before I felt completely stable and could trust my reactions. And for a lot of people that feels like simply too long, but we really need to push through. I also think that doing deep self work while you're going through antidepressant withdrawal is the key to making this process move more quickly. In my experience, antidepressant withdrawal is like a mirror. What happens is that you stop taking the drugs that were numbing your feelings or thwarting all of your problems. And then suddenly all of that support goes away. 
and you're left with nothing but yourself. You're left with nothing but your trauma. And because it's been stuffed down for so long, it comes out all at once. Now, I don't think that most of us really understand how to help ourselves when that happens because it feels so overwhelming. And maybe we have 45 minutes with a therapist once every few weeks and it's just, it's not enough. We need something immediate. We need something right away. And for a lot of people, this can lead them to go back on the antidepressants because it's just simply too painful. But in my opinion, the more deep self work you do, the more you help yourself, the more you face your traumas, the more you work through those things that are so deep in you that you just are almost in just so deeply embarrassed and ashamed by the thoughts in your head, the more you work with those, the more you have compassion for those thoughts and feelings, the more quickly you're going to work through these symptoms. Because I really believe that what happens is that we have all of this pain that's been trapped inside us and the only way it can come out is through our minds, it's through our body. And if we just sit in the pain, it festers. It just, the loops go over and over again and we just think about how much pain we're in and how awful our lives are. But when we look at what's hurting us, when we treat what's hurting us like it's a small child, then what happens is we start to heal. We start to separate ourselves from the trauma and we are able to have compassion for the person who we were when we experienced the traumas we experienced. And then we are able to start healing in a way that helps us release all the pain and suffering. Several studies suggest that self-compassion can improve mood, largely by helping depressed people to avoid negative rumination. For me, the most important thing I did for myself was engage in a self-compassion-based therapy called Compassion Key. Compassion Key was incredibly powerful for me because it allowed me to treat the thoughts and feelings I had in my mind and body as if it was something that really happened to me. Because what I found is that while there were a lot of traumas that I could work through, like the fact that my father uh, died suddenly and the fact that, you know, I was a ballet dancer, so I had an eating disorder and there were lots of things that happened to me that yes, I really needed to deal with. But more often than not, the thoughts and feelings in my head were almost abstract. They were metaphors in a way for what I was feeling. And instead of pushing those aside and saying to myself, okay, this isn't real. These are just fantasies or, you know, thoughts that don't matter. I treated them as if they were the most real thing in the world. I had compassion for the thoughts and feelings and almost the people that were happening in my head. For example, when I was in antidepressant withdrawal, I had all these bumps on my body uh, from a lot of stress. And to me, when you looked at them, it almost looked like I had been bitten by many insects. And when I was trying to figure out how I could have compassion for my body, the image that came to my head was of a man who fell into a well. And he fell into the well and was eaten alive by insects. That's what came into my head when I sat and thought about it. And it sounds a little strange because I've never fallen into a well and this thing kind of seemed like it happened to somebody else, but that's the image that kept coming into my head. So I sat with this man, this, 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 this fantasy man in my head, and I said to him, I'm so sorry, you're sad. I'm so sorry you were being eaten alive. I'm so sorry it hurts. I am so sorry your life was cut short. I'm so sorry you couldn't say goodbye to your family. And as I did that, it created a separation between the images in my head and what I was feeling to this man. I was able to send compassion to this man. I sat there and I sent warm, loving light and thoughts to him until he was able to transition in my head into this sort of entity that was beyond me. And I know this sounds super, super woo-woo, but it worked because it wasn't all about me anymore. It was about the metaphors in my head. And it helped the intensity of withdrawal start to lessen because if I was having these issues and I could treat them in a way that was outside of me, then I could let them go. And that's why Compassion Key was so important to me. Self-compassion helps people to find meaning and dignity in the human experience, including pain, guilt, shame, and suffering. Instead of judging oneself, self-loathing and punishing oneself, self-compassion 
helps you develop the wisdom to know the difference between what you can control and what you have no control over. Um, sometimes um, people resist self-compassion because they don't feel worthy. Um, they don't feel good enough because of the wounds they've had in their histories. So it's really about being able to, um, sometimes I ask people to kind of look at what they um, would say to someone else and taking their own narrative out of it and then they can say actually I would be kinder to that person than they would to themselves and so compassion I think is a swelling up of the heart that um, uh, motivates us to take a action um, and to be able to do that for ourselves re um, requires us to be able to accept the more vulnerable parts of ourselves and know that the, the change process is complicated if you've had these ways of being for many years and you're trying to change them, then it's about being able to be gentle with yourself. Um, compassion really is the antidote to shame as is self-esteem. So to be able to say, be gentle with yourself, take your time, this won't happen overnight. And to be able to dust yourself off and carry on is quite a big process for a lot of people um, and so we really need to understand that relationship with ourselves. And I think it's it's about having an identity beyond our trauma. So I'm not just male who's been abused and not good enough, but actually to be able to um, know that actually it, what, what happened to us isn't who we are and separating out what happened to us and who we are takes quite a bit of work in terms of building that relationship with yourself. Depression is not who you are. It does not define your life or your worth or your future. You are not broken. There are a lot of people who suffer because of antidepressants. And my message to you is that if you taper slowly and you taper with support and you stand up for yourselves and you understand that the pain that can be caused during withdrawal is actually a sign of healing. If you have radical acceptance for that healing and you give yourself a break and you understand that you are experiencing a breadth of human consciousness, it will get better. Your body and your brain will heal itself, but you have to do the work. You have to be in charge of your own healing in your own life and you have to do it in spite of everything. Because what happens is when you help yourself, when you really take control and you demand your own healing, your life will change in a way that you can't even imagine. I know that when people are in the depths of depression or antidepressant withdrawal, it's so hard to think about hope. It's so hard to find the light. But I promise it's possible it's possible if you do the work. You have to fight for it and you have to fight for yourself. And if you fight for yourself, you will heal. But the only person who can help you do that is you. Recovery from depression is possible. People get well every day and stay well, often for the rest of their lives. It is important to know when you need to seek professional help and to whom you should ask for help. The decision to seek professional help is one of the most important decisions that you can possibly make in your lifetime. Well, how should you know when to seek the help of a mental health professional? Well, there are a number of very specific indicators that I can share with you. When someone is feeling suicidal is an obvious time to get help as soon as possible. Suicide has often been referred to as the permanent solution to a temporary problem. And it's such an unfortunate decision when somebody is literally willing to lose their life over the distress that they're experiencing at a particular point in life. None of it's worth dying for. And without seeking professional help, it would be too easy to convince yourself that there aren't any solutions, that suicide is the only logical thing to do, the only alternative that seems viable. I think that's a terribly unfortunate thing. 
And when people act on that impulsively, the waste of human life is just incalculable. Another way to know when you need help is when you know you need to do something, but you have no idea what to do. When you are feeling stuck and when you're feeling hopeless, the solution isn't just going to magically appear one day. The value of talking to someone to get another perspective cannot be overstated. If you know that you're socially isolated and you don't have the ability to reality test with someone, and by reality test I mean talk about your viewpoints, talk about your perspectives, and listen to what other people have to say about it. The value of having close friendships in your life is for people who are close enough to you to be able to say, eh, I don't think you're right about that. I think you should rethink that. The kinds of input that you can get from trusted people that have a different perspective. It doesn't automatically mean you agree with them, but it certainly gives you something else to think about that I think is important. Certainly another indicator of when to get professional help is before it reaches a crisis point. You don't want to wait until you're so emotional and so overcome with stress and overloaded with really difficult emotions to manage that you can't even think straight. It's really valuable to get help before it reaches a crisis point. It's also a valuable time to seek help when you know you need to make some really important life decisions and you want to make them with clarity. This is one of the things that we've learned in recent years about the thinking styles of people who are depressed. You know, in the early days of the research, it revealed quite clearly that depressed people tend to make depressed decisions. And so looking at the quality of their decisions during episodes of depression highlighted how depressed people made decisions that really didn't serve them very well because those decisions were so negatively influenced by the mood state. And now, years later, we're discovering it's even more serious than that, that even when somebody isn't caught in the throes of depression, if they're in between episodes of depression, let's say, that they're still likely to make depressed decisions without guidance from someone else who can challenge the quality of those decisions and point someone in the right direction. It's a good time to get help when you know you need to make some really important decisions and you know the depression could affect the quality of the decisions that you're going to make. And then I think another indicator is when you know that your depression is not only affecting you, but it's affecting the people around you. We know that for people who are in an intimate, committed relationship, like a marriage, that of the people who suffer depression, who are married, there's at least a 50% chance that their depression is negatively affecting their marriage partner or their intimate partner. It works in the reverse as well, that of the couples who come in for marital therapy or couples therapy, there's at least a 50% chance that one of the members of that relationship is suffering a diagnosable depression. Depression affects relationships. Depression it will affect relationships in a variety of ways. But when people are depressed, they tend to be more self-absorbed. Consequently, they're not as sensitive to the people around them and whatever it is that they're going through. Depressed people tend to be irritable, quick to react, angry even, and may end up saying things and doing things that are very hurtful to the people around them. It's why it happens all too frequently that depressed marriages end in separation and eventually divorce. I think it's really clear that if you know you're affecting other people, that it is your responsibility to get the help that you need in order to minimize the impact on the people around you. Your depression is very likely to lift, but the people around you are going to remember the mean things that you said 
for years and years. So it really is important to use therapy as a way of protecting the people that you care about from the negativity of your own depression. Some people will wait until they're in real crisis and then maybe reach out because they don't trust so well and they reached a point where they, they, they can't do it on their own anymore. Um, and others may trust more easily and they may, come, may go for support much earlier. So the, the real answer is when you're ready. One of the things I found to be the most important in mind work is that we need to look at different options and different kinds of strategies and techniques for helping our own mental health. I think what has happened in our culture and society right now, especially American culture and society, is that we view psychiatry and psychology in one specific box. You go to a doctor for your drugs, you go to psychologists for talk therapy, and that's kind of it. Especially with insurance the way it is in our country, very often that's the only option that people think they have, and they don't find that it always necessarily helps. For a lot of people, talk therapy is great, but for so many people, including for me, it just didn't work. It felt like a way to just talk about my problems, but I never found that I actually had any solutions. But there are so many different kinds of people and different techniques, and they can be helpful to so many different people in so many different ways. So the easiest way to figure out whether or not another counselor or therapist is right for you is to try as many as you can until you find the right person. It requires a lot of work. It's like dating. You just cannot just go to one person in your network and expect that they're gonna be the right therapist for you forever. They're probably not. You probably need to go on multiple different therapist dates and try multiple different things and get really weird with it. I mean, like there are spiritual counselors, there are gurus, there are shamans, there are acupuncturists, there are Reiki masters, there are uh, Zen Buddhist masters. There are so many different kinds of people who have so many different strategies and techniques that it's worth exploring. Asking for help is a sign of strength. Instead of living in denial, helplessness, and hopelessness, you can gather the courage to tackle your challenges with professional help from someone who can define and solve your problems with clarity. Remember, depression can be very lonely and isolating illness. Therefore, getting support from others is a key to recovery. Well, the choice of a therapist is a really important one. We want to make sure that there is what I call a goodness of fit between you and the therapist. That this is somebody that you like them. You trust their judgment. You get the sense very quickly and very clearly that this person's on your side, that this person really has a genuine interest in you improving and is going to be very active in helping you improve. So let's look at some of the basics for choosing a therapist. We certainly want this to be someone who is academically trained and legally licensed to practice therapy. It's important that this person has an advanced and current knowledge of the intricacies of treating depression. That treating depressed individuals isn't just kind of a sideline while they're doing other things as well, but it's something that they really know a lot about and, and have a lot to bring to the therapy that they conduct with you. It's going to be someone who is very gently but firmly clear about the importance of you being an active participant in the treatment process. There's more to therapy than just showing up every week and talking about how your week went or showing up and talking about your feelings today. The whole idea is to be with a therapist that is going to be proactive in teaching you skills. And that means you should expect that this therapist is going to be giving you things to do in between sessions. Someone who's going to give you exercises to carry out, materials to read, self-help books to read, experiments to carry out, things that will help you expand your perceptions, challenge your perceptions, acquire and develop and polish new skills, 
the more proactive you are in treatment. The research is clear. The better your rate of recovery, the better your quality of recovery. You should expect to be active in the process and your therapist should expect you to be active in the process. It would be valuable if you have a partner and you have a family that this therapist is willing to talk to them as well. How valuable to get their perspective about what's going on with you. Now, they don't have to turn it into a couple's therapy or a family therapy, but especially knowing that your depression affects the people around you, how valuable it is to give them a voice, how empowering it is to give them a voice, to be able to express how your depression affects them, what it means to them, how it affects their lives, what they do in their interactions with you to try and help and to learn from a therapist what more they can do to help since your family members are such a strong source of support potentially. It's important that this therapist is available for regular consultations, that they're there, that you can schedule appointments and meet with them on a regular basis. And finally, someone who is going to provide information and perspective. This isn't the kind of therapist who just sits back and listens and every once in a while asks a question, but somebody who's willing to react, someone who's willing to share with you, here's what they heard, here's what they think it means, and here's what they want to do with you to help you in that respect. So my advice to you would be, interview a number of therapists, talk to friends and neighbors, find out whether they've been in therapy and whether they like the experience and who it was that they saw and get referrals. But whatever referrals you get, my advice would be have a brief conversation with each of them, get a feel for who they are and how they approach things. No, you can't expect a free therapy session but to have a conversation for five or 10 minutes is pretty routine before you schedule an appointment to get a feel for who this person is, how they look at things, what their style is, what their approach would be, and then go ahead if you like them and schedule the appointment. But even if you start with them, doesn't mean you need to stay with them. If after the first session or two, you don't get the sense that this person is working in your behalf, or this person's going to be as active as you want them to be in guiding you, then move on. Then move on. It's important that you have a good experience with a therapist, not just staying out of inertia or passivity. But we have to take control of our own mental health, of our own process, and do what's best for us. Because what's best for you might not be what's best for me. It might not be what's best for your family. It might not be what's best for your best friend or your acquaintances. You might need something different. So you need to be the one to take control and look for help and ask for help from all sorts of different kinds of people in order to find what works for you. I don't think we, we prevent it. I think it's really about having the skills to notice what's going on with yourself. Notice when you're being um, starting to numb out. Notice when you're starting to feel low and having the skills to be able to shift your mood, whether it's with movement, whether it's noticing that you've talked yourself down into uh, despair through a shame narrative. So we don't prevent it as such, but we can perhaps, you know, I have two, um, two metaphors that spring to mind. Um, if I'm sli sliding down into the, uh, what I feel is a bit of a dark pit, um, my own skills and, and, and coping strategies may be enough to pull me out of that, to be able to climb my own way out. If I'm too low in that, then I absolutely know that I need somebody else to help pull me out of that. There are many ways you can prevent depression. It requires the right knowledge to be put into action. It demands major lifestyle changes in the way we think, feel, behave, relate and respond to what happens to us and around us. It requires life skills to manage everyday stress. 
a deeper understanding of emotions and insights into processing reality better. So I'm often asked, how is it that I might avoid depression? One of the ways that you might think about avoiding depression is simply that you might think about managing your thoughts and feelings in ways that might not make you as likely to start to become uh, down or depressed or feeling blue. Now, there are several ways that you might do this, um, many of which are regard what have become known as positive psychological states. And in fact, we can even cultivate some of these states into what we might think of as positive psychological traits. For instance, uh, the experience of awe. Uh, going for a walk, finding places in nature, or finding uh, perhaps a, a museum in which you find um, great beauty and things that strike in, in you uh, an experience of awe and wonderment. Uh, this, can be a very, uh, uh, this can be a very effective way of um, promoting good, good mental health and preventing poorer mental health. Um, other things like general optimism or hope, uh, expecting good things to come from the future even though um, in the moment things may not be particularly good. Uh, these are other kinds of positive traits that uh, are good to develop. Um, things like gratitude, uh, looking for the things that you are thankful for in life and appreciating the gifts that you've been given, um, appreciating the advantages and the benefits um, that you have living the life that you are currently living. Um, gratitude has been shown to uh, decrease negative mood and increase positive moods again and again in experimental studies. Um, another variable that is commonly thought about in this regard is forgiveness. And again, forgiveness has been shown in multiple studies to have a positive impact not only on people's uh, interrelationships and satisfaction with those relationships, but also things like uh, uh, hopefulness and uh, decreased levels of anxiety and depression. When I first started studying depression, now almost 45 years ago, the very idea of being able to prevent depression was a fantasy. We didn't have good treatments available then, much less the opportunity to engage in prevention strategies. Well, that has changed so dramatically over the course of my professional lifetime. We have developed really good treatment strategies and treatment protocols. It is fair to say that the majority of people who go for help will get the help that they need. There are many different treatment approaches that have been tested and retested in research protocols at universities and hospitals and clinics and agencies around the world, demonstrating reliably that there are good treatments available for depression. And the characteristics of those treatments are an active skill building approach well, beyond treatment, the question then, can we turn these kinds of insights about the need for active skill building approaches into prevention tools has been asked and answered. Prevention programs have been implemented in a variety of settings, certainly in academic environments, whether it's been grade schools, junior high schools, high schools, universities, as well as in work environments, people of all ages that have been exposed to skill building programs in order to reduce their vulnerability to depression. And these skill building programs have been remarkably successful, wonderfully successful. Well, in 2017, the World Health Organization declared depression the number one cause of human suffering and disability around the world. A big problem that's still growing in prevalence. And I think that WHO's Director General said exactly the right thing when she said how important it is that we pay attention now not only to treatment, but also to prevention. 
Well, we've been paying attention to the issue of prevention, but not nearly to the extent that we could. And that's unfortunate, but it reflects the human tendency to be reactive rather than proactive. This is human nature. It's unfortunate but true that so often we wait until a situation is on fire. We wait until a situation has reached a crisis proportion before we react to it. And that's how we do decisions of all kinds. Well, in order to function preventively, especially in the realm of depression, that requires the skill of foresight. And it's terribly unfortunate in my view that even the mental health profession itself has been remiss in encouraging people to develop the skill of foresight. And they've done it for purely philosophical reasons. I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard a therapist say, the past is gone, the future hasn't happened yet, all there is is this moment. Or worse, they say, the future can't be predicted. Well, I think that's terribly unfortunate because it's a global statement and it's an untrue statement. It's not that the future can't be predicted. It's that specific aspects of the future can't be predicted. I can safely predict that if you beat your kid, this child is going to have emotional problems down the line. It's a safe prediction. I can predict that if you smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, you're going to have some health issues. The future is not entirely unpredictable. Some things are very predictable. And the ability to teach people how to think ahead is one of the most important skills that we can possibly teach. And it's predicated on the ability to think in cause and effect terms that if I do this, here's what the likely consequence is going to be. And if I don't want that consequence, then I really better not do this. So much of human misery is generated by things that could have been prevented with just a little bit of foresight. But who's teaching people to think ahead? Every time someone says the future can't be predicted, just live right now, just be fully present in the moment, they are abdicating their responsibility to teach foresight. And I think it's especially important to build that into how we raise our children. I am so hopeful that when we deliberately spend time teaching children how to think in terms of cause and effect, how to think in terms of sequences, why we do this first and then this later, how this precedes this, how this becomes the foundation for this. So even with a two-year-old, to be able to start to ask those kinds of questions, why do you think we put your socks on before we put your shoes on? Why do you think we put the toothpaste on the toothbrush before you put the toothbrush in your mouth? And you're starting to train this young child to, to think in terms of first this and then this. It makes it easier to teach the concept of cause and effect. And it's mastery of cause and effect that allows for the development of both 
insight, and foresight. It's important to be able to think in multidimensional terms, what's called systemic thinking. I'm a big fan of systemic thinking. But it's also true that linear thinking counts for a lot. Linear thinking of being able to understand the relationship between cause and effect. And so the opportunities to think preventively exist in contexts where teaching preventive skills have been implemented as a as an educational protocol, the results have been fantastic. We can prevent depression. We just have to be willing to look ahead, understand the relationship between the skills that we teach today and the effects those skills will have years from now in order to make it a standard part of any academic curriculum make it a part of any parenting regimen to teach people how to think critically in order to be able to think ahead. So much human misery could be prevented if people would just think ahead.